Welcome back to True Words, a Shingon Buddhist podcast. I'm Reverend Kosho Finch, and this is episode 21. In this episode, I'd like to talk to you about Buddhism outside of Asia. This is a topic that has come up in a variety of forms over the last week, so I thought I could address it. And I'll start the conversation with this question. Why does Buddhism, presented in Western countries, and especially that practiced by Western people, look significantly different from what you'd see on a trip to Asia. So let's review how we got here. So looking at Buddhism outside of Asia and toward a creation of a Western Buddhism, often we say in this podcast, our website, blog, YouTube, etc., that we're focused on maintaining traditional Buddhism. So why do we say this? Why do I think it's important to repeat? What are the biggest sources of Buddhist information in the West? Is it Buddhist clergy, academics, Buddhist educational groups, or practitioners? While we need all of them, we especially need Buddhism to be offered and explained fairly and fully, mainly presented from a traditional source and from people who understand how it's practiced. So I'll make a comparison. Would you think it's odd if a Christian organization didn't talk about Jesus, his disciples, or biblical history? When I look around at information sources about Buddhism, I think there are enough outlets giving you less, so why not ask for more? When we consider Buddhism, perhaps the problem is the ism. There's a strong independent streak for Americans especially, and I think sometimes just the title makes people wary. Are there things I have to do? Will I have to bow down to some traditional authority? I think a lot of these thoughts have led to what we see often today, which are secular movements, Buddhist concepts mingled with Western psychology, the ever-present mindfulness movements, as well as new spiritual movements that take bits and pieces from Buddhist practice or Buddhist imagery and combine them with other spiritual practices or ideas. Even more often now, you're seeing the rise of for-profit meditation centers, and I think this comes especially from our American tendency to repackage everything into a product that can be marketed and sold. Our organizations are often limited to meditation only, often limiting that inquiry to the relaxation benefit or the encouragement of certain states or experiences without looking into the mind. And many of these appeal to us for a variety of reasons. But I think we have to ask, do they actually have our best interests in mind? Meaning, are they organized for the benefit of the practitioner? Some object or outright reject various Buddhist ideas or concepts, usually, in my opinion, due to a lack of understanding those concepts. Sometimes, out of this lack of understanding, sometimes to appeal to a certain demographic, maybe due to the teacher's own experience or even prejudice against an idea or teaching. Perhaps it's a Western cultural aversion to statuary. Perhaps not understanding why bowing is practiced rather than handshakes. But are they presenting Buddhism or something else? New visitors to our temple are often struck by the differences between the meditation centers they visited in the past versus what they're seeing at the temple on that day. Clearly, if we make a comparison, there's a difference in the history of Christianity in the United States versus Europe, for example. I often hear of friends or acquaintances who visit Europe, and upon return, I don't hear the same confusion or shock when tourists entered great cathedrals. Usually, they're just overcome by the scale, grandeur, or intricacies. Even though the practice has differed, when the religion was given a chance to present itself, everyone displayed this great appreciation. The language barrier is still there. Some things are unfamiliar, while other things are wholly foreign. Why have our Buddhist centers often diverged so far from their models? Recently, I had the opportunity to visit a Greek Orthodox church. I was very fortunate to hear the priests give a very good overview of the icons, their symbolism, usage, and the history of many of them, many of which were quite old. 
The response from the tour group was largely positive, with most finding the traditional approach refreshing. I found this response astonishing, as there was an abundance of iconography, traditional practice, even incense. I thought, why don't as many people have the same response upon touring Buddhist temples? For one, I think it was allowed to be itself, present itself, rather than be explained or presented by someone outside the organization. Most in Western countries have been presented a very feel-good version of Buddhism, explained through social justice movements, ecology, psychology, various sciences, all of which are useful lenses I find most fascinating, but still not Buddhism. Why not an inspiring investigation of some of the great saints or religious figures of Buddhist history? To be fair, in a traditional Buddhist temple, there may be a host of things happening and sometimes a teacher whose language skills create communication difficulties. But many people are arriving with a certain set of assumptions and expectations created by non-practitioners, sometimes those with a shallow understanding and others with an agenda. So how was it done historically? The historical example was that Buddhism was generally introduced by monks, often at the invitation of the government or at the urging of other government officials. For example, one king would suggest to another that they look into Buddhism. This was the model for Japan. The king of Korea suggested to the Japanese emperor that Buddhism would benefit the nation. After some urging, Buddhism was transplanted to Japan, later primarily from China, with monks from China coming to Japan, and later Japanese students going to China to study and learn. I should point out that despite our cramped flights and poor choices of flight in-flight entertainment, the journeys were significantly more difficult historically. The teacher may then be invited and asked to lecture or write about the Buddhist teaching and offer that teaching at court. If successful, generally land or a temple was constructed to support the teaching. This provided a focal point for the teaching and the network of translating texts and starting the process of learning the culture, language, customs, and how best to adapt the teaching style to the local people. While, of course, monarchy has largely given, given way to democracy, so we no longer have imperial land grants, especially in Western nations, we can learn something from this method. Buddhism was invited, as were people who had dedicated their lives to the study and practice of it, and it was allowed to speak for itself. The people then engaged in translation work and writing explanatory texts. A proper practice space was established and the teaching allowed to slowly conform to the local conditions. By comparison, how have we largely come to learn of Buddhism in the Western world? Our Western example primarily shows a transmission through academic sources or interest groups, so-called import Buddhism. I find that these have been helpful in a variety of ways. They're very helpful for providing source materials, especially helpful in providing translation of texts, but they may not give context for a practitioner. We don't necessarily know where this text fits into the studies overall or our understanding and practice as an individual. Or often they come with critical analysis that may not be relevant to the practitioner, especially at an early stage. We do have another model, so-called immigrant Buddhism. Often, when I talk about traditional Buddhism, I met with the responses about recently arrived Asian immigrants bringing with them a form of Buddhism that people have been acculturated to think isn't actually Buddhism, but rather ancestor worship or folk traditions that happen to play themselves out inside the gates of a Buddhist establishment. There seems to be an invisible wall between this immigrant Buddhism and most Western people. Yet here in our communities nationwide, Buddhism thrives in forms and in practice methods the way it has for hundreds, if not thousands of years before, what I'll call as hiding in plain sight. Especially in most larger American cities, there's likely to be a Buddhist temple where most dare not trod. Next, I'll talk a little bit about what I'll call the curious case of Hawaii. The U.S. state with the largest Asian population proves that Buddhism is compatible with modern lifestyles, American values, and culture generally. Some fascinating modern examples of Buddhist teaching, and also many examples of practices popular in the late 1800s, 
that persists as if in a time capsule. Strangely, this isn't a Mecca for Americans interested in Buddhism. It has beaches, you know. I even have it on good authority that the residents of the great state of Hawaii enjoy the Super Bowl. They've even produced two Buddhist members of Congress, Senator Maisie Hirono and Representative Colleen Hanabusa. Buddhism is still new, so generally I'd say we have to be careful that we're actually interested in practice and study rather than engaging in collecting something new, mysterious, or exotic. We also have to be honest about our biases and our cultural perspective and the assumptions we bring. If our views about Buddhism are too much shaped by Hollywood and certain popular television shows of the 1970s and mixed with Buddhist imagery and healthy doses of Kung Fu in the American West, we may be disappointed. So what's next? I think there are certain pitfalls if we don't change course. If we limit the Buddhist teaching to a thin slice, we are robbing ourselves of 2,600 years of practice, knowledge, and commentaries. Not to mention a whole host of artistic pursuits inspired by the tradition. Sometimes we turn away from these traditional sources because we're rebelling against some perceived authority. But history is bound to repeat. There are likely corollaries to modern issues which, having affected past practitioners and institutions, would likely provide useful resources for modern problems. Let's be careful of what we think the spirit of the teaching is before investigating the teaching. Let's not take away the potential that will grow into other aspects of the teaching later. Settling into a state where perhaps youthful rebellion eschewed certain practices that could later become transformative practices. I know that when I first spent time in a Buddhist temple, I was more interested in meditation than chores, but gradually I came to see the beneficial connection between the two. If we remove these and create only a comfortable diversion from our hectic lives with Buddhist elements or themes, we are robbing ourselves of the opportunity to transform grow and deepen our understanding of the very important concepts within this teaching. Most often, I see Buddhism being stripped of ethics, moral teaching, and context, so it becomes an amorphous idea rather than a path of transformation. So here's my final point. Many philosophies, many paths, many comparisons can be made, all to great benefit. But please investigate Buddhism for what it is what it has to offer the world. Please choose books and explanatory materials that actually make reference to Buddhist literature. There is more than enough to draw from. You may not understand all the concepts that the Buddha announced initially, but don't toss them aside because of this. Place them on a shelf and investigate them more deeply later. Inquire more broadly. We have more source materials in English and Western languages than ever before. Remain curious. And if you're really perplexed, suspend judgment. For myself, I feel I have a duty to curate the Buddhist tradition and offer it to you with comparisons and discussions drawn from Western culture and philosophy, but still keeping Buddhism intact. My realization from reading the sutras may not be the same as your realization, so we need to maintain the sutras and their traditional commentaries so they're available for you. Because it's new to us, because we're slowly importing it from other cultures, and yes, probably is very different from what we're accustomed to. But don't dismiss it as superstition and move on. Ask questions. This episode is not against anything. Rather, it's for maintaining, alongside these new ideas and practices drawn from the Buddhist tradition, the entire Buddhist tradition and teaching. We mustn't change the Buddhist teaching into John or Susan's teaching, but rather maintain the tradition so that all of the future John and Susans may come to an understanding and application relevant to their lives and their situations. Thank you for once again spending time with our podcast. As always, if you have suggested topics, areas of interest, or feedback, please leave a comment or feel free to contact us. Thank you.